I often get asked why I don't play my Gibson ES-175 more often, so this guitar. And in general, not everyone understands why I mostly prefer semi-hollow guitars over archtop, and of course, specifically, my ES-175. The Gibson was my main guitar for more than 10 years, so while I was studying and also a few years after, that was the guitar that I played the most. And an odd side note to this story is that I later also discovered that I had in fact not bought it legally. The guitar that I played when I did my audition to get into the conservatory in The Hague was this Steve Ray Warren Strat, which I had fitted with flatwound 13s at the time. Not the most obvious of choices, I guess. The guitar served me really well until then while I'd been playing in Copenhagen. And the Strat was my first sort of serious guitar. And I've been more busy trying to learn to play jazz than looking for what is traditionally considered more of a jazz guitar. So I hadn't really thought that much about it, figuring that it was much more important what and how I played than what guitar I used for it. The audition was nerve-wracking, and actually I was so nervous that I don't really remember that much about playing it. I do remember that after the teachers had discussed my performance, I was called into the room again, and I was told that I'd been accepted, which was the most important thing. And they also told me that while what I played really was jazz, then once I started studying, I would have the option to borrow money from the school to get a real jazz guitar. Later, I asked my main teacher, Peter Nivaf, about this, and he told me not to worry about it, explaining that one of the other teachers, Ave Albers, also mostly played a Strat. But I did start looking around for an instrument since people kept asking me why I played that kind of guitar and not a normal jazz guitar. A few months later, I'd been to some shops and tried some different guitars, but mostly being scared by the price of a new Gibson and also not really liking how they felt if I was allowed to try them, I hadn't found one that I really wanted to get. A friend of mine told me that he's seen an ES-175 that had just gotten into a shop, a guitar shop in The Hague. I went there the same day to try it and it was a 50s model, not that I could actually tell at the time, and it had some setup issues but was probably a good option. The price was pretty okay, but in hindsight, there might have been a reason for that. I pretty much don't know anything about guitars, but this guitar played quite well, except for the first string, which was buzzing high on the neck. And it was in the original case, I think, and it seemed like it had been lying in that case for a long time, which turned out to be true. The owner of the shop assured me that he could set it up to fix that fret boss, and that turned out to be true as well when I came back the following day. It really played like a dream, and actually, it still plays amazingly well. He insisted that I pay in cash, saying that he didn't trust foreign students and the shop did not accept credit cards. So I went to the bank to get the money and took my guitar home. When I showed it to my teachers, I was made aware of how lucky I was that the guitar had aged well. The top of these guitars can sometimes, over time, yield under the pressure of the strings and that can render the guitar completely unplayable. And I also learned that it was the same type of guitar that Jim Hall used for a really long time, even if he changed the pickup in the early 70s, and probably also what you hear Wes play on the incredible jazz guitar album. I did the rest of my study on that guitar, a few different albums, and I also took it on tours around Europe and a single trip to North Africa. But around that time, I also started to get into more modern jazz styles, which didn't really agree with this guitar. There were two things that started to become a problem, especially with the music that I was playing and writing myself for our band Trappen at that time. I could feel that I was lagging sustain when I was playing, which meant that I couldn't do some of the things that I wanted to do. And another thing was that while the guitar has a beautiful warm sound, it does have a very pronounced pick attack. And to me, it felt like I was missing sort of a singing quality in the tone and that the guitar was too percussive, I guess. Now, obviously, I was both coming from listening to rock and blues guitarists who play with overdrive and more sustain, and I was also at that time mostly listening to people who played with a more modern sound, singing sustain, reverb and delay, mostly Kurt Rosenwinkel and Ben Monder. This is difficult to demonstrate, even though it is so easy to feel when you play it. Just to give you an idea, here's a short phrase with some sustained notes on my Ibanez. And here's the same thing on the Gibson.
if you're trying to sustain notes and then have other things moving around it while they're playing, then that effect is almost impossible on the Gibson if you compare the two. And if you're soloing and in your head you hear a long sustained note, then it quickly becomes frustrating when that note does not behave like you want it to. And of course, especially if you're playing a long note and then later adding a chord under it while it keeps ringing. I think the difference is pretty clear and easy to hear, but I wonder if it's really clear how massive it actually feels when you're playing, because that's of course the big difference. You want the guitar, the instrument to behave in a certain way, and that is sometimes just not possible with certain instruments. A short side note on this, while I was researching stuff for this video, then I came across a few discussions online about thunk, which was actually a new concept to me. Apparently it's the sound of an arch top like this, with a pronounced pick attack and very little sustain. I found a few really good quotes from Christian Miller, who also makes videos on his channel, The Jazz Guitar Scrapbook. Uh, maybe Thunk, because sustain is for kids. Something like that, right? I guess this is considered the holy grail of jazz tone by some, and obviously I don't really fall in that category, but I'm curious what you think. Another tangent that I came across and that this made me think of is that if you listen to most jazz guitarists, then it's fairly clear that the whole turning down the tone and not having any treble in the sound is sort of a myth. But I guess that's a topic for another video. Before I gave in and decided to try and find another guitar to replace this, then I first tried to get the ES-175 to act like a semi-hollow by using reverb and delay and even also experimenting with overdrive but that was not very useful live. Oh no! Reverb and delay was also not really getting me any. So, of course, if you use an overdrive pedal with the ES-175, then your amp is not going to explode. That's just an artistic representation of how much feedback that will give you. And I also just really wanted to make a video with an exploding amp. Reverb and delay was also not really getting me anywhere, which was when I realized that probably I needed another guitar to get the sound that I wanted, the sound that I heard. I have sometimes had the comment that I should consider just changing the pickup in the guitar since the single coil P90 pickups will not give you as much sustain as a more compressed humbugger. And of course that is probably true and I am aware that my ES-175 doesn't have the same type of sound as what you hear with a humbugger version, which is pretty clear if you listen to someone like Jonathan Kreisberg or Pat Metheny. Also how Jim Hall's sound changed when he replaced the pickup in his 175 going from the P90 to a gilt humbugger, what you hear in this concert clip. Compared to how he sounds with the P90 in this one. Obviously you can't really compare these two since they're recorded differently and there's almost 10 years between the two recordings, but I think you can still hear a difference. So maybe it is just mostly about the pickup, but having played the guitar the way that it is and considering the fact that this is an instrument from the 50s, I didn't really feel right to try and change the pickup. That said, I do have the impression that I'm not a huge fan of P90s, possibly because of my playing style, which relies heavily on alternate picking, and I do find that they have too much pick attack and a very sort of aggressive mid-range. That could also be a part of the reason why Jim Hall almost always turned down the tone and the volume on his guitar, because he is actually one of the guys that do do that. I guess I could use this video as an excuse to get an arch top with a humbugger. I switched to using semi-hollow guitars as my main instrument in 2010, which also fitted much better with the music that I wrote for the second Traben album, Push. First the Epiphone Sheraton, and later the Ibanez and the ES-335. A few years later I started making YouTube videos, which I thought was a lot of fun, and therefore I'm of course still doing that. And in 2017 I suddenly got an email from a guitarist in Belgium, who told me that the guitar that I had on the wall behind me in the videos was in fact stolen from him when he was living in Amsterdam in the mid 80s. He could describe it in a way that made it clear that he did indeed know it up close. And that was of course a bit of a shock, 
and I guess whoever stole it had uh, not been able to unload it or dared to unload it and therefore it didn't surface until 15 years later in a shop in a different city. The state of the guitar did really fit with it having been put away in an attic for more than a decade and making this video I am realizing that it was actually a little bit funny that I had to pay in cash but at the time, I didn't find it super strange that he did not trust foreign students and foreign banking. I was lucky that the previous owner did not want the guitar back, which would also have been pretty complicated since I bought it 18 years before that. In this video, I mostly talked about what I didn't like about this guitar, but I actually do use it fairly often, simply because it's an amazing instrument and it plays really well. And there are some things in my work that calls for an instrument like that. So that's also what I bring, things like more traditional big band stuff, or if I have to play things that are more leaning towards swing, and I'll probably never sell this guitar, just considering the staggering amount of hours I've spent playing it during my study. Another guitar that I don't use all the time is my Epiphone Sheraton, which I think is also really an amazing instrument, especially since it was so cheap and easy to upgrade. If you want to know more about that, then check out this video.